In this second lesson, I'm going to set up the Maya scene and get started with blocking out my silhouette in ZBrush. I'll start by showcasing and importing various resources that I need for my scene setup. Then we'll move to setting up the HDRI lighting for the scene. Next, I'll set up the background as it appears in our reference. Then I'll close out the lesson by starting out the blocking of the silhouette in ZBrush. This is a resource I use for my food modeling projects. It's an old head I sculpted, a hand I repurposed, and a plate I modeled for an old project. They are all set to real world scale. And since they are things that we typically see when we see food, they help me to gauge a good size for whatever food I am creating. The measuring markers hovering on top on the side or in front of these models are showcasing numbers in centimeter scale. So the head is roughly 22 to 24 centimeters tall, about the maximum for a head size. Palm is 11 centimeters and the plate has a diameter of 20 centimeters. I'm going to keep them in the background for as long as I need and then hide them when I'm comfortable with the size of our cheeseburger model. For organization purposes, I'm going to group them in the outliner and call them real world scale markers. This resource is called a look dev camera. I'm going to go into the Arnold viewport renderer so we can have a better look at what it is. Now I'm going to look through that camera and let me add a test light to the scene. I'm going to add a sky dome and also add an HDRI so it's a little bit easier to inspect. The Macbeth chart or color inspector you are seeing on the bottom left side of the screen, along with the shader balls that are right underneath it, are called a look dev setup. And they are mostly for VFX artists to do color correction, to inspect and fix how color and value is behaving in the renderer. When you are rendering, you can use the Macbeth chart to inspect the darkest and lightest values of your render to make sure nothing has a pure white or pure black value. That is not a common thing in any realistic photo or render. The darkest part of your image should never be a pure black or zero, and the brightest value should never be a pure white or one. So that is one good use of the Macbeth chart when you are rendering in your 3D software. I'm going to go into perspective and go a little closer to it so I can show you how they're operating at a closer distance. The shader balls help to show how the HDRI or environment is acting with the various shader properties of your model. Here on the right, we have a transmission ball to see how your lighting is interacting with transparent objects like glass. On the left side, you have a chrome ball to see how it's interacting with reflective objects. Since the chrome ball is a direct reflection of the HDRI image. It also lets us understand our HDRI's orientation a lot better. It helps me better identify where my hot illumination is coming from. What I mean by that is where my most intense lighting is coming from on the HDRI. It's a lot easier to identify it if I just look at the shader ball. And this is because most of the time, after the HDRI is set up, we're going to hide it. So having to turn it back on to inspect its lighting is not ideal. So you can always look at the Chrome ball just to get an idea of where the lights are located, depending on your orientation in the scene. The neutral gray ball is for calibration. It helps you keep track of your values. It has a 50% or 0.5 value. The blue one helps me to see how my HDRI lighting is interacting with 
colored shaders. I must mention that the Macbeth chart is loaded onto a surface shader. Surface shaders have no shading properties, they're just flat. This is very important to do that. I'm going to delete the HDRI and get this resource into our main scene. It's already organized really well in the outliner. So I'll save this file. Return to my main scene and import it. Okay, so it's in here. I should be able to access it by going to panels, perspective, look dev, and it's in here. So I can look through it. And all the pieces are over there. I can set it up as a camera on the side. I'm going to delete the namespaces because it came in with a really long namespace. I don't want to look at that messy name while we're working. So I'll go to Windows. Uh, general editors namespace editor select it and go delete merge the root and it should clear out all the prefixes that came in with the import i'm going to make these two resources available on my turbo squid page for free so if you want to download them and use them to follow along in this course you can have access to them i'll put the link in the description of the video I'm going to be cycling between eight HDRIs to test the 3D model in different environments. The HDRIs I will be using are from polyhaven.com. I will include a link to all of them in the video description. The first three are by Sergej Majborada. First one is a small studio setting, which is close to what our main reference is most likely using. The second one from him is a nice indoor scene of a small apartment. Most of it is a kitchen, which is good. And the third one is another indoor scene that pushes out cool and warm lighting. The fourth is by Demetrios Sava and Jared Guest. It produces dominant red illumination. The next two are from Greg Zhao. I really like the first one from him. It has a mall kind of feel to it, a lot of fancy lighting. So it will be like the asset is mounted on a restaurant table in a mall. The second one is a fireplace lit room. Another one with very warm illumination, like the fourth one from Demetrius and Jared. The last two are from Andreas Mishok. A nighttime lit scene and an outdoor forest scene. The objective is to pick as many different environments as possible. Now let's get back into Maya. I'm going to set all eight of them up with a switch node so that I can cycle between them very easily in the attribute editor or in the hypershade. So I already have a ground plane in the scene, but I'm going to recreate it just to show you how I did it. All right, I'm just gonna go create polygon plane scale it up right to about that much it should be good and i'm going to grab the edge and i'm going to extrude it so i'm going to go to the modeling menu edit mesh extrude extrude upward That much should be good. We'll go to edit mesh. And I'm looking for insert edge loop options. I'm going to put in about 10. That might be too much. I'll do 8. Okay, and then if we look at the reference, there's a nice gradation here, which we're going to try to simulate. So for we're going to do that later after I set up the HDRIs, but for now I'm going to delete a few of these edges at the corner. 
So I'm going to select those edges by double clicking on them and go to Delete Edge Vertex. That should give us this. And if I hit the three key, okay, that might have been too many edges. Uh, maybe we can get away with. Let's try. Let's try one first. Yeah, that should be it. That should be enough of a gradation. And if it isn't, we'll start. We'll come here and slowly start moving this back. Or we'll move that back and forward to alter the gradation. But I think this is good. All right, let me start by importing my eight HDRIs. I'm going to add an Arnold light to the scene, so a sky dome. So I'll go lights, add a sky dome. And for now, all I'm gonna do is maybe scale it up a little, just so it doesn't get in the way. About that much. Okay. Open my hypershade, and I'm going to load all the eight HDRIs I showed you in one by one. So I'm going to tab and hit the file key to load in a texture. I have all of them stored in the project folder, all eight of them downloaded. I'm going to load them in in the order that I introduced them in. So we'll go with Studio Small, that's the first one. I'm going to load it in as raw. I don't want Maya to make any color correction or alterations to it, so I'll load it in as is and call it File Studio Small. I'm going to pause the video and load all of them in in the same way and come back when it's time to connect them to the switch. Okay, so I have all eight of them in here and I've renamed the file name to match. I like to do the prefix of whatever node I'm using and then the name of what I just imported. Okay, so I'm going to look for the AI switch node. There it is. And this is going to allow me to plug all eight of them into all the out colors. I must mention that I'm using the 2K version of each HDRI. Um, I used to use the highest resolution possible. They go up to 16K sometimes, 20K resolution. That's just unnecessary for what we're doing. The only reason I can imagine needing something that high is if you're rendering something that is so reflective and you want the exact, you want the HDRI to be reflected onto the surface and you want it to be of the highest fidelity and you're going to be rendering at some obscenely high resolution, but it's just not necessary otherwise. Now I'm going to select the HDRI and add it to the scene. And I'm gonna pipe the out color to the color of the HDRI. I'm gonna select it here, go into the attributes editor and just try cycling through them to see if it's working. Yeah, it seems to be working. Let me just confirm by getting into the Arnold view. I'm going to temporarily hide this floor plane. I'm going to take this and I might just do a copy tab. So I have a copy of it. So when I select other things, it doesn't disappear and just cycle through. Yeah, so we have the ability to cycle between all HDRIs. In order to help me get the background set up, I'm going to be using the last double cheeseburger model I created as a test model to see how well our scene setup is going to interact with our final model. I stripped the model of most of its ingredients so that I'm only left with what I need for this test. I'm mostly trying to end up with a burger that is about the same size of the burger we are going to be sculpting. And also, I don't want the result to take too long to render. 
All right, so we're back to our my scene. I'm going to import the stripped burger asset. So go file, import. Okay, there it is. I'm gonna move the plate out of the way, move it to the back along with its markers. So I'll grab the plate, it's the first one. Move it back to about there. I'm going to delete this light source. It came with the import. I don't need it right now. I might add some lights in the scene later to aid the HDRI, but we don't need it right now. now I'm going to go to Window, General Editors, Namespace Editor, and yet again strip the namespace so we get a clean result in our outliner. Now the next thing I'm going to do is set up our look dev camera to look similar to our reference over here. It looks like a tall resolution, more than likely 1080 by 1920, but I'm going to go one size higher to 2K. So I'm going to go through our look dev cam. I'm going to go to settings and set it up as 1440 by 2560. Go Panels, tear off copy, and make this our side window, and then go back to perspective here. Go to panels, perspective. Okay. And I'm going to get as close as possible. And I'm going to create a layer for our real world scale markers. It looks like I put the background in here. I'm going to get it out of there. And take our real world scale markers, add a layer, call it real world scale layer. OIR. Okay. Just hide them temporarily. Just zoom out a little bit for now. See how much. Don't have that much side room. So I'll stick to about that. Now the next order of business is to shade the background like we have it looking over here. I found some black polished granite textures on three different websites, but we're going to try all three of them. I've put the links to the website in the video description, but I'm going to be testing them out. It might end up being this one that I'm looking at right now but the others are also just as interesting. But I think I'm gonna start with this one because this one looks fairly close to our reference. Because none of these textures are tileable, and also because I want to contain the rendering of the ground to a smaller area, so I don't end up having to wait a long time to see results. I don't want to be rendering complex shading properties for this entire background because it's really just, uh, flat color with a gradient like feel to it, which I can very easily simulate with a surface shader and some ramp shaders or not even really, I just need a flat color and the lighting will do the rest. The lighting from the HDRI or the lightings I put in the scene will help give it a little bit more interest. But this is the focus here, this ground plane here, black granite, reflection in the black granite and then later on we're going to do a depth of field render so that this is our focal point and we have some blaring in the foreground create a cylinder a polygon cylinder scale it up isolate just to delete the parts i don't need so i have this and center pivot Scale it up just a little, bring it down. I just need it to extend past the camera. So about there, right there, it's cool. Maybe just a little bit more. And I'm gonna go into the UV editor and check what the UV looks like. Okay, looks like it has a good UV. That's the cylinder usually comes in, a good UVs. I'm going to do a packing, go to UV arrange and for a layout, there we go, layout. 
and that should spread it through the one one uv tile evenly it should fit it perfectly all right so now that we have that i'm going to assign it a standard surface shader call it AISS black granite. I assigned a standard surface shader to this background. I'm going to just give it a little bit of color for now, just a white color. Go there. Okay. So now let's load in our texture for this simple cylinder that I just made and assigned a shader to. Okay, so I'm going to load in the granite texture. So click here, hit file, and load it in. Six key. There it is. The chips are fairly large. Let me try one of the other ones. I don't want to spend too much time doctoring this image because I have several of them and just want something that closely resembles what we have. This one also has fairly larger chips. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt a tiling of this. So I'm going to go into the hypershade. And that's it right there. I'm going to rename it first. File. Black. Polished. Granite polished and then I'm going to select this node this place node and crank up this repeat value to tile it so I'll start with three and three yeah this is what I was sort of trying to avoid not too much tiling let me check the last one to see how well that one will behave with the tile Do a little bit of cheating by rotating this. I still feel like I need one more tile. Let's try three. No, that's not going to work. Let me check the Arnold render, see what we're getting. It's not that bad, but it looks like I might need more, I might need to tile it or I need something with more of a granular feel to it. I think tiling is a solution, but because of how the values are spread, it doesn't look too good because you have a darker part here and we have a lighter part here. So what I'm going to do is take this texture into Photoshop and then do some burning around the dark areas to lighten it up a bit. Let me open Photoshop and show you what I'm talking about. So, so we're in Photoshop and what I'm going to do actually could be a little bit more simpler than I'm thinking. Initially, I will try to burn it and see what it looks like. So I'll do Control J to end up with another layer. Take the burn tool in Photoshop. It's that one right there, it's burn. And then, actually, I have the wrong thing. It should be not burning, but dodging. Okay. So if I go dodge and shade, you see it's uh, brightening up the, the super dark area. But now it might be a little bit too... Now to help myself make it more tileable, I'm going to go J, Control J again, and I'm going to go Control T and rotate, rotate it 190 degrees, 180, and then create a mask, and then use a brush tool to fade away this part. This part is not so interesting. I'll make sure I have my brush set to black and paint away the mask so that I can get 
something that's more attractive. This central part is not too fun. And I think this should be tileable. This should work better. I think maybe let's see, put this back because that's not as interesting. Okay, this is a lot better. I think it's a more unified color. So I'm going to save it. I'll name it mod for modified and I should be able to load in that PSD. Okay, so now we're back in Maya. I'm going to load in the new PSD I just saved and it's just a little bit better. It will tile a lot better. It's looking like it. There is a part of it here that isn't faring too well. So I'm gonna go look for that and deal with it and reload it back in so we can do some more tiling. So it looks like it's this bottom half right here. So a good resort is to use the spot healing brush that also pretty does a good job. So I'll sample this region. Actually, let me I'm gonna hold on Alt to take this lock away. And I'm gonna select everything and go Control Alt E to come up with a new layer of all of them merged together. And then I'll take my spot healing brush sample anywhere in this region and then just paint to get rid of that lip and I think we should be fine now so if I save this and we go back into Maya yeah it's gotten rid of that so it's a little bit more tileable so now that it's more tileable I'm going to try to go for that granular look by Increasing the repeat to about say five, a repeat of five. And now in our main view, we're a lot closer to about the size that we're seeing in here in our reference. It's pretty close. Okay, so this is a good starting point. The next thing I'm going to do is select that background and try to go with a color that better matches what we have in here. I'll sample it from screen, so I'm gonna move it to the side here and then click the sampler and pick that hue. And initially I was worried that it wouldn't blend together too well. So I was going to use some tricks to make this floor blend with the background, but I don't need to do that because it looks like it's blending pretty well. I'm going to copy this tab so I can click off the geometry and adjust this thing's roughness. So those specular highlights are not acceptable. So I'm going to go higher with the roughness until we have a completely diffuse specular. Okay, that works a lot better. All right, and I think I do have to do what I had planned. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to plug a ramp shader into this thing, into this particular texture this material, this black granite material, I'm going to plug it into the opacity. So I'm gonna open the hyper shade and find it. This is our black granite. And I'm looking for the, this opacity value. I'm gonna hit tab, type ramp, or ramp texture. And I want a radial texture. I want a circular texture, not a radial texture. Right. And I need the outer part of it to be transparent and the inside not to be. So something like this. And it looks like I'm going to need one more color that is produces a better gradation. Something along these lines. I need a good gradation. So, But ultimately at the outskirts, I need it to disappear. Let's plug this into the opacity, see what we get. All right, I think I might have forgotten about one more property I have to enable to allow this thing to operate like a transparent object. There is a property in the Arnold tab of the geometry. So I'm going to go to the geometry's shape node and in the Arnold tab, yeah, there is something over here that says opaque. There we go. So you have to uncheck opaque so that you can let it know that this thing can receive transparencies. So now when we come back here to our ramp, I can now take this ramp, crank it up. Okay, so we have our shader back. 
and now we need this gradation to do to make our back there have it blend more with the background and i think that's pretty good yeah that's about a good point let me try some of the other interpolation options do a exponential up exponential down smooth yeah i think smooth is what i want but i do think i should select add one more value and control the grays as we recede so i think that's the solution yeah i think that works pretty well it's, let me look at our reference one more time okay i'm going to go back to this value this color and reduce it so it goes like a little bit of a darker hue and then i'm going to crank down the specularity yeah i think this is a good starting point okay so this is going to be our test scene every time we sculpt and i want to check how things are going i'm going to bring our sculpt back here and the reflection also seems to be behaving correctly when it's colored i might have to make some modifications to the reflection but i think we're good next i'm going to create the depth of field effect and then we're going to move to zbrush and start blocking out our silhouette so to enable depth of field i'm going to start by showing object details i'm going to go display heads up display and show object details what i'm looking for is this value distance from camera i need to know how far away this burger is away from our camera here so if I select this burger, I should get a 44.542. I need to enter that number into my, my focus distance right there. But before I do that, I have to enable depth of field. So I'll enable it. And 44.542 goes in here. 44.542. If you're not seeing any depth of field yet, I should see some blurriness at the foreground here. But if not, I'm going to crank up my aperture. I should start seeing something. Yeah, that's a little bit of a vicious aperture. So I probably need to tone it down. 0.5. That's still too much. I'll go with a 0.25. It's not bad. It's a lot of blurring, but it's about the same amount of blurring I'm seeing here. If I stack this side by side, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. I think that's it. Let me try point two. And I think we should settle over there. Yeah, that's going to suffice. If there are any issues i want to make sure nothing in our focal point is blurred and i think we're pretty good nothing in the focal point is blurred we just have the foreground blurred so it's good but this is just a starting point and when we bring our real model in here we might play with this aperture value more to make sure that we're not blurring out any of our burger let me open the unknown renderer see what it's producing so we can have a closer look Go to the look dev camera. I'm just looking to make sure nothing that's supposed to be in focus is out of focus because I was having a difficult time seeing it in that small viewport with the viewport renderer. So when this bucket's region is clear, zoom in, confirm it. And then we'll start with the sculpting process. Yes, it looks pretty good. Nothing over here is blurred, so we're fine. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'm gonna stop this, and because we're not close enough, I should have gone a lot closer. So I'm going to move a little bit closer to better match our reference about there. And then I'm going to select this, 
and it's a new value 36.086 so that should be 36 and that should be our final location restore this One other thing I'm going to do is lock the camera. I don't want to move it anymore. So I'm going to go up here and hit the lock. And this is our final staging camera. If we need to unlock it and move things around. Now I know there's a bit of a mismatch with the way the rough highlight in the background is looking compared to our real one, but I'll deal with that later. When we get our real asset in the scene, I will make the necessary changes so that it's favoring this side. It's a lighting issue, a lighting of the background. So we might have to take a area light and make it illuminate this side more and make some more changes. So I'll deal with that later when we come back with a real asset. Now the viewing angle is a little different, but it's not a big deal for now. As we play around and bring in the original one, I'll start tumbling the camera just a little bit to better match this viewing angle but for the most part we have it about the distance we need it to be we have the dof working we have the reflection working and we should be fine for now i'm going to do a rearranging of the look dev chart because it was obviously out of focus because it's not within the focal point that we established, the 36.52 something value. So it has to be in our, in our focal point to be seen. So I'm going to just move it back here and as high up as possible. This lesson has become a bit too long, so I'm going to postpone the blocking out of the silhouette for the next lesson. In the next lesson, we will dive into ZBrush and I will share some really effective techniques for fleshing out silhouettes and primary forms of your subject.